the way you want to segment it is going to depend on how you experience time, at least in the manner that I'm approaching things. So if you're, you probably want to have something that's a to-do list that's like today, like this is the stuff I have to do today. And then another one that's this week, like what else is going to happen this week? And then depending on who I work with, some people can do a this month one and it works for them. And other people just jump right to later, like a nebulous kind of later section. Uh, it depends on their ability to hold information and organize stuff and all, all those sorts of things. ADHD Rewired episode 388. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mention on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. We are here for our monthly live Q&A with our whole panel of podcasters and coaches. And Barb, let's go ahead and introduce everyone here. Let's start with sort of order of birth of podcast. We got Brendan Mahan. Hi, everybody. Brendan Host, the ADHD Essentials podcast. And next week's episode... Uh huh. Jessica McCabe. So, and if you're listening to this on the podcast, that's like a month and a week ago. Yeah. But I'm rolling up on 200 sometime soon for your, Sweet. those of you on the podcast. That's awesome. And uh, next, we have Will Kerr from Hacking Your ADHD. Hey there, everybody. How's it going? Going well. And next, we have so who, who's in birth order? We have uh, MJ Siemens from the ADHD Diversified podcast. Hey, it's right this time. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to Moira Maven, the host of the ADHD Friendly Lifestyle. That's right. And in honor of making lifestyles friendlier, um, this summer, I'm actually releasing episodes every two weeks to make my life a little bit more ADHD friendly. So my last one was an episode about summer and coming out of the pandemic. And it's I'm really enjoying that. And we have Coach Roxy Martin, future podcaster of, wait, what was the question? Nice, nice. Hi, everybody. Hey, Roxy. All right. And finally, we have Barb McDonough, who is the kind of the, the executive function grease around here, keeps things moving. I would say that you're a clown because you juggle so many things, but calling you a clown probably wouldn't be very nice. <laughs> but I mean, in the nicest way possible. Master juggler. Um, remind me to work on the intro for me, Eric, next next month. <laughs> I'll give you a script. <laughs> Hi, everybody. All right. So we already have a first question here with Maria. Hi, Maria. Hi. Hi. Right, what is your question? Um, I was diagnosed four years ago with ADHD. Um, I want to know more about my specific type. I've heard people talk about details of theirs, like combined type and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um so I'm trying to get some guidance on how to get that information. All right. So what has your psychiatrist told you is your, uh, what, what kind of ADHD you have? None. She just said ADHD. And I've tried to call other psychiatrists to get an appointment and the staff is like, oh yeah, no, we're not going to know that. So maybe I'm not asking the right question. I don't, I don't know. So, you know, there are kind of three uh, presentations of ADHD. Not that long ago, ADHD subtyping moved from subtypes to presentations. The reason being is because they found that over time they can change. So someone who is uh, uh, presenting with a predominantly hyperactive impulsive subtype of ADHD um, can later on present only with the inattentive presentation of ADHD and it can go both ways. Most people, though, are the combined type of, of ADHD. 
So, um, you know, it's the, the strategies for a lot of them is really just looking at um, like what's the functional impairment, you know, because anytime you're dealing with any kind of diagnosis, it's a starting point, right? But it does, it's not prescriptive to tell you, oh, I have ADHD, so I should do this. So it's that, that starting point. So is there, if you had like one kind of burning question about how to, how to figure that out, what would you want to know? It feels okay. So I'm not, I'm unemployed right now and I'm uh, jump starting a teaching career online. I was a teacher, Moira. I love your podcast. Oh my God. Um, teaching, I had my child, he's four now. And once I had him, I was like, oh my goodness, why can't I do this? Uh, so long story short, I quit teaching and I'm trying to structure my day so that I can apply to an online school. And I'm just finding it's really hard, like everything I'm trying to do. Okay. So, I don't know, just direction. I'm planning an entire day. I've been breaking it into pieces and just trying to do piece by piece. So just a direction. My purpose of wanting to understand this is to help myself structure the day better. Okay. So, if, you know, going back to sort of the original question as well, um, you know, this, there are a total of 18 sort of symptoms on that ADHD sort of diagnostic list. For adults, you need five out of nine of either the hyperactivity and impulsivity, there are six features of hyperactivity, three of impulsivity, and then nine symptoms of inattentiveness. Okay. You need five out of nine of either, or if you have five out of nine from both, then you have that combined type, right? Okay. Kids, it's six out of nine. It also, those symptoms need to be present from childhood. It used to be an arbitrary age of seven, but there has to be more of a history. Um, and so, I mean, you can literally Google DSM symptoms of ADHD to get that like sort of textbook definition of which symptoms and which presentation do you have. But again, it's that those things can fluctuate. I know for even for me, I'm, I'm mostly the inattentive presentation, but I have some impulsivity that can kind of creep in at times, um, sometimes in that that can fluctuate as well. So um, so I don't know if that's helpful for you though. No, it's very helpful. I'm, I'm registered for, uh, coaching groups in the fall. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out how to hold on till then and uh, problem solve my schedule. Okay. I do have a counselor and I, we work on a lot of things and I have lots and lots of tools. Um, I just need a little more guidance and I can't talk to my counselor every day. So, you know, until I do those coaching groups, I'm just trying to get some uh, something to keep it together till then. Awesome. Moira, what do you, what do you got? Two pieces um, directly related to uh, the types. Um, one, as people age too, we tend to internalize symptoms more. So the hyperactivity that can be in um, the inattentive type may be more in of thought, right? Or even in combined in the hyperactivity, it's not necessarily like you're hyper physically. Um, and then the other piece that I uh, recently learned is we often hear that women are more likely to be inattentive type. However, they're more likely to be an inattentive type in inattentive type. Like there's double the noun of, so if inattentive type is 10% of people with ADHD, there's a two to one ratio in that one of women. Because I think often what I thought was it meant that most women presented as inattentive type. But as Eric said, across genders, most people present as combined type. Yeah, so. Meta inattentiveness. <laughs> so if you are uh, purely... And highly inattentive, you probably didn't like. You probably spaced out some way through the very end of that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. <laughs> it's noon over here. This is like the worst time of the day for me. After lunch, like it's all downhill from here. I'm trying to problem solve this. <laughs> all right. Well, I hope that was helpful for you. Very helpful. Thank you so much. All right. Let's uh, let's bring on our next person. That would be Malika. And here we go. So my question is about um, ADHD and menopause. Um, I've seen that my symptoms seem to have become much worse since that has hit me full time. And I understand that there is also some research base that symptoms really can become much uh, bigger. And I was just wondering uh, what you know about and anything around that topic. Moira. Thank you. So yes, um, it's largely due to our friend estrogen um, that once you go through menopause, your body is not making any more. 
And estrogen reduces ADHD symptoms, which is why when women are pregnant, um, they have fewer ADHD symptoms as well. And when women are in perimenopause, their estrogen is actually more erratic than in puberty. But in menopause, this is an area that I'm researching as well. And it there is some... There's research to show that um, hormone replacement therapy can help because it's providing estrogen, but it also depends on people's own health profiles with um, regards to whether or not that's healthy. In my instance, I have migraines, I have a family history of cancer, so that's not going to be an option for me. One of the options was is to consider a, an increase in the dosage of my medication to help. And a lot of the things around lifestyle become more important, getting enough sleep, the exercise. But there is, um, there's a, a new book by Dr. Jennifer Gunter. It's called The Menopause Manifesto. And she's considered quite an expert in that area, not so much on ADHD, but on, on managing menopause. There's a researcher in the Netherlands who is looking into that area. I was going to ask that? you what, what other language you speak. I'm from the Netherlands. Oh, you're from the Netherlands at the moment. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah. I thought you had a similar accent to her. I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but I will actually on my website. So I have a podcast called yes, the ADHD. Yeah. Okay. So the episode about hormones, there is a uh, webinar on there by that researcher. Um, okay. And I will be doing more episodes on that. Is Was there specifically something like you're looking for the research? Tell me more about what. Yeah, I got only diagnosed while already in the uh, menopause, but I made a month before Corona hit the world. I moved from the, I did my uh, professional life, my uh, working life mainly in the UK, and I moved in February 2020 to Germany. So, and then the pandemic hit and a new country and a new culture and a new language. But I've been really experiencing much more forgetfulness yes. and also I've been really shocked how difficult it has been to learn the language when I speak yes. five or six languages quite yes. okay yeah. and I learned German as a child um, but also another thing the amount of stuff I'm losing now and uh, while I was moving I did the course of Eric and so that gave me a lot of tools because then I was only diagnosed for half a year so partly I'm trying to understand just what's going, what is going on anyway with the ADHD. Sorry, um, I have a lot of hay fever, so I'm I'm not crying because just yeah, that's uh, hard. Um, <laughs> it's just <laughs> really fun. I have the cleanest eyes in the world, <laughs> um, but I'm also just really uh, curious how people um, how people handle or yeah for specific tools to add to my toolkit right uh, because it does um, i'm unfortunately completely exhausted at work um, and therefore had to call in uh, sick so mm -hmm. this is also now for me a time now that i'm on demand to make sure that my toolkit is as good as possible right so all those things that you're describing are unfortunately very common um, and are a result of no longer having estrogen and also having ADHD. Um, one thing to consider is finding out what your hormonal levels are. And if there's someone who is able to work with you on that, on trying to optimize those. Um, where we're at now is that women with ADHD really need to be advocating when we can for the research in this area, because as you're saying, it directly impacts our quality of life. Yeah. Um, yes. Thank and, you very uh, much about, for that. Yeah. yeah. That's really been helpful. Okay. I'm glad. I look forward to on the, the podcast and the website. Thank you. Thanks Malika. All right. Let's, uh, let's go to one more question and then we're going to take a quick break. The next question is from Sandra. She is asking, how can I help my 14-year-old son become more organized for high school and writing notes for his classes to study from for tests? Brendan, I'll let you start with this one. The first question I have, and this is a question that is an instructive for everybody, I think, who has this kind of question, is what's going on with the IEP and the 504? Does he have one? Does he not have one? 
what are the supports happening at school to help him get to where he needs to be? Because if he's bad at taking notes, he's not going to think that the notes are useful as a tool to study from because the notes that he has that he took aren't useful to study from. So the best option is to get someone else to take notes for him, whether it's the teacher providing those notes or a peer providing those notes, and then have him study from notes that are useful and see if that doesn't change his mind about whether or not he should be studying from notes. And getting notes from someone else also gives him a model to help him understand how he should be taking these notes so that he can do a better job moving forward. But be patient with this because it's it's great to say, oh, he's got this model. That means now he knows how to take notes. But that isn't true. That's not really how it's going to work. What's going to happen is he's going to do like, I like to say 10% better, right? It's going to be a little bit better, but maybe not even all that noticeable for a while because he's got to practice this new skill until he has it locked down. The tricky part with this kind of stuff is you don't go to school with him, so you can't take the notes for him. So there's kind of a limited ceiling on how much a parent can do to help their kid unless the parent starts leveraging IEPs, 504s, talking to the teacher, talking to guidance counseling, talking to special education teachers and that kind of stuff to get the team that's supporting your kid to come on board and recognize this problem. Yeah, there's also like, you know, there's tools. I mean, things like the the, you know, the digital smart pens right. or even if you can have... Uh, Oh my gosh, I wish that we can, when I was growing up, we could just have a, our phone and take a picture of the board, right? Like, yeah, that's a lot of that stuff is more college than high school, though. That's why I didn't quite go into it. Yeah. Some schools, some teachers will, will allow you to do that. But even that stuff has to start with mom or dad talking to the teacher, because if the kid just whips out his smartphone and starts taking pictures of the board or pulls out a digital pen, that potentially is even worse. If you got a, a, a bleh, if you have a pen that's recording the audio of the class and you've been using that for like three months and then the teacher finds out what it is, some teachers are going to get really upset about that because they didn't know they were being recorded and that kind of stuff. So you really want to get out ahead of it. All right, Roxy. I just actually personally appreciate what you said, Brendan, because I have never been a, a solid note taker. Uh, it makes no sense once I've written it down. I have no, I've just had to work really hard at it. And I like that you talked about getting those models. I've noticed that my note taking, um, I've upped my game in the past couple of seasons because I'm seeing notes from Moira and from um, some other folks who are doing the same kind of things that I'm doing. And it's helping me to find my way. But I also appreciate that you were talking about how it's incremental changes and not to expect that just because you get you know, a template where you get some really good information that you're going to be able to automatically um, become amazing at it because I'm not, and I started to get discouraged, but um, as a 55 year old, like I'm totally adopting some of these strategies. <laughs> now, there's also a, uh, a program and I've had her on the podcast many years ago. Uh, uh, Mary D. Sklar has this executive functioning uh, program or one of the things that it teaches in this program is how to draw your notes instead of writing your notes. And I got to tell you, that was super helpful for me as I was sort of, when I used to work with kids, you know, I was learning this curriculum to to uh, to teach. And it's just super helpful because it, it kind of just taps into a different part of the brain. And it does take some practice and you don't need to be an artist uh, to, to do that. I had Danny Donovan on talking about that too. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it really, so that can be really, really helpful. And there are, I think one of the big issues is, and this is true for adults too, that sometimes we don't know what's important. So we take notes on everything. Right. And so it's like, uh, how do we even distill what, what's the most important thing? Another quick thing before we throw it to Will, when you're taking notes, take notes in two different colors. I do this all the time. I'll start with like a blue pen. And then when the concept changes, and that's my only requirement, when the concept changes, I skip a line, I change my pen color. Now I'm writing in green. Concept changes again. I skip a line. Now I'm writing in blue again. And it just lets me get into the notes more easily because my notes are chunked in color. And it's not like I'm color coding, like this color means this concept. It's just alternating back and forth so I can see when one idea ends and a new one starts. Cool. Will? Yeah, I was just going to reiterate the sketch note idea. It's really great to just help create that organization. Um, 
can't remember if Brendan also mentioned that he uses uh, Cornell notes, uh, which are a fantastic way to just organize your notes because then it gives you like little like uh, combining that with sketch notes. You can just have little pictures along the side of your notes that go, oh, this is going to be a key point. This is going to be a name that I have to remember. And just having that little bit more of a template you fill out while doing your notes can make it much easier to come back to them and understand what you were trying to write. Cornell notes are just, there's sort of a section walled off to the left and a section walled off at the bottom. And then there's that sort of, most of it is that upper right section. And you can do different things with the sections on the left and on the bottom, depending on what you want to do. Usually that larger space is for the primary notes. The way I typically do it is, Larger space is primary notes. The left is like action that I'm going to take around the notes that I'm taking or a connection that I've made. And then the bottom is any resources that get mentioned in the course of that lesson, whatever. That could be good for business meetings too. Right. Awesome. Moira? Um, I was going to say a couple things. Is um, One, as someone who went through school with undiagnosed ADHD, I really found how-to books. And, you know, like people have gave lots of good suggestions here, so I'm, I'm not going to get into that, but sort of it was like a, a lifelong skill. Then when I became a teacher, I actively tried to teach these things to my students because I thought it's things they need to know, not realizing, and other teachers don't often do it, not realizing it was because of my own struggle with it and that other people can pick it up. My point is, if we can find people when the kids are younger, even in, you know, elementary school or in middle school, like fifth, sixth grade, they can start. So if you can cultivate, this is a lot sometimes too, this can be about relationships with your child's school. And if you can have a conversation with, you know, whoever does in, you know, where I am, it's the school counselor who does the scheduling that maybe that there's educators who are going to be more helpful with things like this so that it's sort of looking at it as building it as a lifelong skill over high school and whatever they go on to. Um, The last thing is I wouldn't discount or just consider the use of their friends. Uh, I have a child the same age and they, she relies heavily on her peer group for if she misses instructions or that sort of thing, just to be able to share different strengths with each other. And, and maybe, the, and that can, might make studying easier too. Have, have uh, your kid offer, you know, uh, a good note taker five bucks a, a week for their notes. I mean, seriously, it's like, why not? MJ. And um, because there's so many different ways to take notes, um, I personally wish that I was allowed to explore different ways of taking notes because I used to be the one that would draw pictures for taking notes and then I would get in trouble and then the parents would be like, well, why are you drawing in class? But it's it's relevant to the topic. So I think coming from maybe the, the kid's perspective, I would like to be a part of that conversation so I can uh, explain and express like what's working for me and what doesn't and why it's working and why something else hasn't been working. Like I think having having the kids have the voice to of what does work for them instead of how it was like, well, you're supposed to do it this way would be really helpful, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Roxy. Well, I was just thinking that for for me, the issue with the note taking is my difficulty with prioritization. And um, and so I have always had a hard time figuring out sort of what do I need to know? It's helpful, I find, if I'm really specific about what I'm going into the note taking experience needing and wanting, expecting. I almost have to write myself a little roadmap. And the other reason it's really hard for me is that my working memory is literally 4%. So if I don't have that roadmap, I get into the note-taking thing and four sentences in, I'm like, I don't know what the hell I'm taking notes on anymore. I don't, I don't know why I'm here. So if I can go into it first with a little bit of prioritization and keep it really succinct and then have another reminder of it in another spot, then that sometimes can help me. Yeah, I think that there are a lot of different note-taking strategies and it, and like all things ADHD, they require experimentation until you kind of figure out what works. So let's take a quick break. We will be right back with some more questions. So we will be right back. Our award-winning online video-based coaching and accountability groups have helped over 600 adults to live more intentional and wholehearted lives with their ADHD. 
Have you ever wondered if you could live the kind of life you really wanted for yourself? Do you have a vision of where you want to be, but you aren't quite sure where to start? What would it be worth to you if you were able to work with other adults with ADHD to be understood and accepted and to finally tap into your potential you might not even know you had? Whether you're new to the podcast or you're a longtime listener and even wondering if it's your time to join our intensive online coaching and accountability groups, your chance is here. You can join the 26th season of ADHD Rewired's coaching and accountability groups by going now to coachingrewired.com to add your name to our fall interest list. We've already had our registration kickoff event last week, but that doesn't mean that you've missed your chance. Our next registration event is coming up this week on Thursday, August 12th at 1.30 p.m. Central. That's just two days away. The deadline to register for our second registration event is tomorrow. Registration is by invitation only. Head on over to coachingrewired.com to get your name added to our fall interest list. And if you're already on our list, keep an eye out for your email for instructions on how you can join this week's registration event. Registration fills up fast, so to increase your chances that you can get a spot in the section that works best for your schedule could be four sections. Join us for our next registration event. Head on over to coachingrewired.com and add your name to our fall interest list to get your invitation. Yes, we have ADHD. Yes, our goals can feel difficult to reach and sometimes we might not know exactly what our next step is. And when you join our coaching groups, you might discover how the power of community can propel you forward and get you unstuck. If you're ready to take your next steps on your ADHD journey, join us. Our coaching and accountability groups are made for people with ADHD by people with ADHD. You really don't have to navigate life with your ADHD alone. Find out more and sign up for our fall registration event by going to coachingrewired.com. That's coachingrewired.com. And even if it's past the second registration event, go to that website to find out when our next event is. That's coachingrewired.com. If you like ADHD Rewired, then be sure to check out all the other shows we have here on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Here on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network, there is a little something for everyone. For tips, strategies, and really satisfying dad jokes in 20 minutes or less, check out Hacking Your ADHD with Will Curb. Parents or those working with kids, check out ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan. For a personal audio journal giving voice to her peers as an Asian Canadian with ADHD, check out the ADHD Diversified podcast with MJ Siemens, who is now the new editor and post-production manager of ADHD Rewired. And if you're a late diagnosed woman who is curious about how hormones affect your ADHD and you won't want to miss the ADHD friendly lifestyle with ADHD rewired coach Moira Maven. And coming this August, Will Curb of Hacking Your ADHD and ADHD rewired coach Roxy Martin are coming together with their brand new show called, wait, what was the question? Find all of us at ADHDrewired.com and then click on Podcast Network under the Podcast tab so you can easily subscribe and share all of our shows. Oh, and I could really use some fresh reviews on Apple Podcasts. Those reviews help others find this show and they also brighten my day. And while you're there, throw some ratings and review love to the other podcasts on our network. Meet all of us every second Tuesday of the month at 12.30 p.m. Central for an hour of live Q&A on Zoom. To register, go to ADHDrewired.com slash events. Come with your questions and hang out with me, Brendan, Will, MJ, Moira, Roxy, and Barb all on Zoom. It's a lot of fun. You definitely will not regret stopping by. That's ADHDrewired.com slash events to register. Thanks so much for listening, subscribing, sharing, and reviewing all of our podcasts with others in the ADHD community. 
Your support means the world to us because we want to reach as many people in the ADHD community as possible because feeling alone and like nobody gets it sucks. So please help those who could benefit from hearing our podcast by sharing the word. Share our shows or maybe show them how to download it if they've never listened to a podcast before. You can find all the information about our podcast at our website at ADHDrewired.com. All right, we are back and we have our next question here from Ryan. Hello. Um, so I am in my mid 20s. I just recently learned about ADHD and my largest struggle is in the workplace. Um, I work in a church and I, I basically do a lot of event planning. Um, some things are weekly, some things are monthly, some things are once a year, it's very seasonal, like Christmas and Easter. And so I feel like once I like have a system, like everything's different all of a sudden. Um, and I've tried a lot of different systems and I, I just wanted to know what's a good starting place. I just got the time timer and that has worked wonders already. Um, but I've probably tried what I feel like is every single planner in the world and the to-do list can run for miles. And so, yeah, I would love to hear from you guys. Um, I saw that there's like a pick five tasks method, but I, I don't know. I just, I would love to hear from you since be, I, I'm a little overwhelmed learning all about everything. <laughs> all right. So um, it sounds like you're, you're in, in one hand sort of looking for some tools, but then on the other hand, looking for methods. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I would say that's correct. Okay. So the sort of the good and bad news is, is that you get to try a bunch of different tools because you're going to find ones that, that work for you. And then one day you're going to be like, wait a minute, it's not working for me. And it's not that it doesn't work. It's that you got bored of it. Um, so this is why we, we have to have a, a, a big toolbox and then we can sort of cycle through our tools. The old tools become new again uh, once we do this. So there is not one right way to, you know, manage all of the things, right? There is, I would say, one rule, get things out of your head. Like, don't keep things in your head ever. Um, it's, it's one of the most reliable places where things get lost, right? So we want to externalize as much information as possible using things like a, a calendar, a to-do list. Um, and, you know, to-do lists don't need to be super fancy, right? Like the tool itself, I think a lot of people think the tool is the thing that's going to help them, you know, deal with all the things. So much more of it is how often and frequently we are interacting with our tools. Like, you know, the an analogy I like to give is like, you know, you wouldn't, uh, if you use a GPS to go somewhere, you wouldn't like program your GPS, and then throw it in the trunk, right? And this is how a lot of people use their to-do list. They write their to-do list in the morning that they don't look at it again for the rest of the day, right? So having things, you know, close, spending 20 to 30 minutes a day planning your day, uh, spending about a half an hour to an hour planning your week. And so you're kind of clear on what those priorities are. Because if you're only looking at sort of 24 hours ahead, then there's going to be a lot of things that you are surprised by that you don't need to be surprised by, right? You said that you have a lot of things that are kind of cyclical, but maybe once a season or let's say you have a big event once a year, maybe even three months before that event comes, you have something in your calendar that just says this event is in three months. You need to start planning it next month. So just to kind of like cue you, like, oh, okay, this is when this thing is coming up. And again, to the, the words that we put in our calendar events and on our to-do lists are so important. I think people try to, you know, use shorthand and so they'll write something down, kind of like going back to what we we're talking about earlier about notes. We go back to our thing. And we're like, what does it mean? Right. So, you know, put more information on your to-do lists and in your calendar than you think you need. So just assume that you're going to forget everything that you needed to understand about that thing when you look at it. So leave notes to your future self that will assume you forgot all things. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, I've been trying to do kind of a brain dump in the morning. So I think, I think I'm on the right track. And I've been listening to all of your podcasts, literally every single one of you have been listening to all of your podcasts and it's been so helpful. Um, I guess you could say I, I've been hyper-focusing on those things, but it's been very good. You guys are doing a great job. Well, and kudos to you for, for taking this seriously and for seeking all this information. You know, Can I hop in? Yeah, please. Um, 
on the put in more information than you need, I'm kind of thinking about the event planner part right now. This is how I consistently screwed up my calendar. I'm going to share it with you so that you don't make the same mistake. My events are usually workshops and trainings and things. Those are the stuff that happen randomly that I like can lose track of. So I'd put them in my calendar, but I'd put like workshop at Dartmouth College or whatever. And what I wouldn't write down was my point person. Like I wouldn't write down who my contact is at that workshop. So when I'm trying to make sure that I'm going to do it right and I know what information I need to know, and I'm, it would I would lose 15 minutes to a half an hour trying to find the right person and who I need to email and all that stuff. Because they didn't always have like at dartmouthcollege.com or whatever. Sometimes it was like person's name at Google. And I'm like, I don't know how to find this person. So put your point people in when you're doing your, your planning and your, your event stuff. The other thing I want to point out, and th- I'm, this might sound like I'm running counter to Eric, but I'm not. I'm just kind of fine tuning it a little bit. You mentioned that your to-do list gets ridiculously long. So you want to segment your to-do list, which is making things a little more complicated. And I apologize in advance for that, but it'll probably make life easier in the long run. The way you want to segment it is going to depend on how you experience time, at least in the manner that I'm approaching things. So if you're, you probably want to have something that's a to-do list that's like today, like this is the stuff I have to do today. And then another one that's this week, like what else is going to happen this week? And then depending on who I work with, some people can do a this month one and it works for them. And other people just jump right to later, like a nebulous kind of later section. Uh, It depends on their ability to hold information and organize stuff and all all those sorts of things. But break your to-do list down into some kind of a time chunk so that it doesn't become totally overwhelming. And whenever you get to that later, make sure you're writing dates on like I have to do this thing. What at what point do you need to do that? So that when you're reviewing the later list, it's clear when that needs to get moved into this month or this week or whatever. I want to add to that too that you know when you're looking at your day, there's really only two items you really need to to be real uh, sort of present of mind with, and that's what you're doing now and what you're doing next. Mm-hmm. Like everything else is just noise, right? Because having the, what you're doing now obviously helps to stay focused on, on the now. What you're doing next, having that present helps you transition between tasks. So once you go to that next task and the next becomes now, then look at your bigger list and say, all right, what's, what's going to be the, the new next thing? And then, you know, because I think when we look at 20, 30 items on our list and maybe that's like, we think that's our daily, but really that's our weekly. We just we are just really optimistic or we're planning optimistically. It's also one of the reasons why I do the most important things first. I am an optimistic planner, right? So, but I do not like, I don't think that I failed or that I'm doing anything wrong by having 75% of the things on my list not get done. I'm trying to do the most important things first. In reality, we can do three to five things a day, Yeah. right? So those are some of the tips that I think are helpful. Is there anything else, Roxy, Moira, Will, that we didn't say that would add to that? Uh, I'd add on that the biggest part about using to-do lists and planners is just consistency and getting used to that system. The reason why you've tried dozens of planners is usually because you did it for like a week and it didn't work, or at least this has been my experience when I was trying to figure out how to use planners. Uh, so the way to just, there's no perfect planner. So if you just use one that's good enough. It often really helps. And the way I got into using one just good enough was just through uh, accountability group where I would post my schedule every day for you know a couple of months. And then suddenly I'm like, okay, I know what works and what doesn't. I don't have to do the entire thing here. I can just do what works for me. And it's okay that it's not perfect. Roxy? I find that if I'm having a really hard time getting the things done on my to-do list, that it's a good idea for me to check my boundaries. Sometimes I just have so much on my list because I'm saying yes to too many things or I feel obligated to do too many things. Sometimes I can clear out a handful of things just by doing a little check on that. That's, that's great. One of the best things we can do to kind of free up space is to say no. And just because it got put on your to-do list doesn't mean it has squatter rights to stay there. You can remove anything you want from your to-do list. And because we, you know, have CRS or can't remember shit, like, don't worry, you're going to forget it was ever there in the first place real soon. All right, let's go to another question, Ryan. I hope that that was helpful for you. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. You bet. All right, let's go to another question here. All right. We have a question from Kim about food and diet. 
in January, 2021, I started eating whole food, plant-based, vegan, and find it is really helpful, helping everything, health, energy, and ADHD symptoms. Wondering if that is the experience of others that might've gone whole food, plant-based. Anyone here have any experience with that? MJ and Will? Oh, right, I, MJ. What? What? <laughs> MJ, go ahead. Um, so b- before I was diagnosed, I did try out, you know, I, I went pescatarian and then vegan and then raw vegan. So that was fun. Um, I think for me anyway, it really depended on my activity levels of how I felt because at the time and, and still now I'm sort of practicing what my body feels like when I eat certain foods because it's not always the same. Like what I could eat five years ago is definitely not the same as what I can eat now um, because it affects my body differently. And I think it would really, really depend on people's tolerances. I know that some people, they can't eat nightshade plants. They can't eat other things because they're allergic. If people are trying to get in, um, you know, more uh, healthy fats, and if you're allergic to certain species of nuts like pine nuts or if you're allergic to peanuts like you can't have those so while i think it could potentially be beneficial for people um it would like everything that's adhd it would just take some experimentation and learning and observing what feels good when we eat certain foods cool well uh and one thing that's always going to be great for your health is when you do switch to diets like that you tend to just up the quality of the foods you're eating you're not eating candy bars and all this other junk food that absolutely is detrimental to your ADHD. So taking out some of those foods that are detrimental will help. Uh, I know there's not any specific studies that show veganism is good for ADHD uh, or any other diet for that matter. I've looked into like, what's the best ADHD diet? And I'm like, there's a lot of things out there, but none of it has any studies backing it up. But just taking away foods that are- Any good studies anyways. Yeah. I mean, it's tricky. Yeah. Nutrition studies in general are suspect of how they're done, but yeah, just taking away foods that are going to be bad for your ADHD will help though. Roxy. I just noticed that for me, I have a significant problem with inflammation and inflammation gives me brain fog. So, so for me, I know that if I eat a lot of um, highly refined food or like white stuff, that I'm going to be foggy. And it, and it does come back to that inflammation thing for me. So just finding out like what made me foggy, at least narrowed the parameters of what to eat and what not to eat. Yeah, And food, food stuff is so tricky because it's, you know, I, I've been struggling with it. I have a corn sensitivity and corn is in freaking everything. And it goes by like a hundred different names. Um, most of them aren't corn. And, and at the same time, like I'm not a hundred percent sure that it's the corn, but I, there's definitely something that I eat that just messes with my digestive system. And similar to Roxy, like when I get the thing that inflammation, I get the, the brain fog and it's, it definitely affects quality of life. Is this actually a like does having adhd make us more sensitive to to foods i don't think we know that so i think that like from an individual basis if you're noticing that you're having uh if you don't feel good when eating certain foods or if you notice that you were eating kind of maybe healthier for a little while and you just notice an increase in energy like pay attention to that there's so much out there with food so it, it is it's frustrating but I think maybe working with a dietitian and doing some experimentation to just see how you feel. And I always think of Will with this one too, is drink lots of water. So, Brendan, go ahead. Yeah, circling back to what Will said, because I, I think it's really important. When we go to these more extreme diets, right, which is what going vegan is, it's a pretty extreme approach. Often, the, one of the reasons it helps, we lose weight, we feel clear. It's because we're replacing a lot of the crap with you know, broccoli and lettuce and apples and stuff. The reason it's important to to recognize that that might be a big component of why things are getting better is because extreme diets can be hard to maintain. So if you go vegan and you're like a month and a half in, you're like, I just really want a hamburger and you cave and eat a hamburger. Folks with ADHD, a lot of the time we're like, well, screw it. Like I didn't do it. It's over. And if you don't sort of look at the fine tuning of this and go, oh, that was working because I was not eating as many Snickers bars and Chips Ahoy cookies. 
So yeah, I ate a hamburger, but I can still eat fewer chip stick uh, Snickers bars and Chips Ahoy cookies, and just also eat hamburgers along with my lettuce and my broccoli. Probably you're going to get more mileage out of it. I noticed for myself, there's a threshold. I know that there's times where I can have a little bit of something um, and be okay. Then I'm always like, it's this weird thing because then I'm always like, wait, is it a corn thing? And then I'll have like something a few days later and whatever I ate a few days ago, what maybe didn't fully get out of my body. And it's like, it's it's not fun. It's not fun. Why are, and then let's take a quick break. I'm working with a really good dietitian and she gave me an analogy of when we remove foods, whole food groups from our diet, that it's kind of can be thought of a bit like when we have a sore throat, right? When we have a sore throat, we're not going to eat scratchy foods because it's going to irritate our throat. So of course, if we're eating smooth, cold things, it's going to feel better, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we should eat that way always. And so if we take something out of our diet and like a complete food group, and we're not replacing it with something, then nutritionally, we're going to become deficient. So we might feel initially better and then feel worse again. And then what people sometimes tend to do is then look to say, what else should they take out of their diet to feel better, as opposed to considering maybe I need. And so, because I was one of those people who was doing that, and I've actually been able to put everything back in my diet. I was off dairy, I was off wheat, but like you guys have said, I have to monitor the amounts right? Of what, I, of what I'm having of those things and the types of what I'm having of those things. Because yeah, we can just sort of start to think like, okay, let's take something out because we feel better. But just because we have a scratchy throat doesn't mean that we're going to, you know, we should be on a liquid diet forever. And so that was just an analogy that worked. Thanks, Mara. All right. Um, let's take a quick break and we will be right back. We've got a couple other questions lined up for you. So we will be right back. So Real quick, just a couple of announcements. Uh, Adult Study Hall uh, is is uh, thriving right now. If you are looking for a virtual co-working space to work with other people with ADHD, go to go to adultstudyhall.com. Uh, uh, we have a 24-hour um, a day Zoom room that is dedicated to just working with other people with ADHD, and we also have a bunch of other cool sessions. We have. Um, our Taskbuster session which is a two-hour session where you bring a dreaded task in. We have uh, a session on uh, Tuesdays and Thursday mornings where people are working out together. We have a, on Sundays a cleaning and decluttering session. We have a job seeking session. Those are all guided sessions. And again, we always have our, our uh, room that's open 24 hours a day uh, for virtual co-working. You can try it free for a week. It's uh, only $19.99 a month after that. Um, so check it out. It's adultstudyhall.com. Well, I have one thing to add real quick. As we've uh, talked about in the last podcast, uh, Roxy and I are going to be doing a new podcast coming up and we're already working on episodes. Part of the thing is we are answering questions and we are going to be taking viewer questions too. So if you have a question you want to have us look at, you can email us at questions at what was the question podcast.com. I love the look on your face of, oh shit, what was he stressing again? I'm like, oh man, I, got, I have too many words, the question too many times. <laughs> awesome. We are back. Let's cue up the next question, Barb. Who do we have? Actually, we have Gina. Excellent. All right, Gina, what is your question? Okay, so I'm in the middle of getting assessed for ADHD at age 37. And looking back when I was younger, I definitely had a lot of strategies on how to get around my ADHD, like in school and, and stuff. But at, at work, I'm finding myself doing a lot of paperwork and I hit the wall and I'm pretty sure I need meds in order to bridge that gap between um, my strategies and my brain, I guess. Uh, what does it, for anyone who has been, who when they were an adult, um, did you notice it right away or does it have to build in the body? Um, how do you distinguish, oh, these are the meds working versus like a placebo effect, like that early motivation that we get um, when we take on new projects and, and new um, habits and things like that. So how do you measure progress? 
And, um, or does it just not matter unless you see the results? But my concern is that you say, oh, it's really working. And then after a couple of months, be like, oh, it's not working anymore. And they have to switch meds and switch meds and switch meds. And is it just an early placebo effect or is it actually working? So I, uh, I think that um, when you're, you're taking ADHD meds, especially if you're looking at stimulant medication, there should be a wow effect. Like, I think that most people do experience a wow. I think that, um, you know, I know for myself and I was 19 when I first started taking meds and I still so vividly remember uh, that first time taking uh, that little tab of Adderall and sitting in my college room and reading a book. And for the first time I knew I got through a chapter and actually knew what I had just read because my thoughts weren't going in like a thousand different directions where I just read all the words on the page, but didn't comprehend any of them. You know, so it's, it is, I don't think that the placebo is going to really be the thing that makes you do better on that. Cause it really is it, it for when meds are working, it's a, such a profoundly noticeable difference. You know, I also know that for me, it, it sort of shifts me out of neutral when my, my meds sort of kick in for the day, right? It's like, I can be thinking about all the things I need to do, but until like the meds kind of kick in, like I'm stuck, right? And so that's, that definitely helps me. What have everybody else's experiences been? Mine was a little more subtle. Mine was more of a huh than a wow. Okay. Like I, I know the thing that I noticed was instead of walking by things that were on the floor, I picked them up and put them where they were supposed to be. Like if there was a pencil on the ground, I would pick it up and put it in a, like a mug that was holding pencils or something, which isn't so much like an overwhelming wow thing. It's just like a, oh, this is what like normal people do. This is what like neurotypical folks who are able to do the thing. This is what that's like. So it's mine was a little more sneaky, I think. I have to say that, uh, you know, I used to take Adderall. Now I take uh, my Deus. But so that Adderall helps me do the things that normal people make look easy. Yeah. Yeah. Moira? Um, I, the first time I took mine, I was driving. And all of a sudden I realized I was not strategizing when I was driving. Because I I was always like so much strategy. I was content to just drive. But it also gave me a lot more peace in my brain because I didn't have as many thoughts. Um if you are someone with ovaries and have a cycle, um, that will impact how your medications work over the course of the month. And so um, I have information on that on my website, the one about cycles. And I also have an episode, the one about medication that also has the tracking tools for side effects. And, and the general rule is you want to increase your medication until um, the side effects outweigh the benefits. And sometimes prescribers are um, hesitant to do that. That is best practice. It is best practice to do that. Um, but they're hesitant. And so they'll just ask you, well, how are you? And when you don't have a frame of reference for it, you don't know. And so sometimes people will stop taking a medication um, that might actually work for them at a higher dose. Well, uh, I'm kind of similar to Brendan, where it was more of like a, huh, rather than a wow uh, for my medication. And for me, it's just really noticeable when I'm not on my medication where it takes a long time for me to form my thoughts, uh, recall answers and things like, I know it's there, but it's just, I'll have a lot of pauses and trying to exaggerate now to give kind of example of way be like, oh yeah, I do answer things slowly. And that's kind of like where I'd be when I'm off my medication. And it just feels like I'm back to normal when I'm in on the meds. Anyone else want to share their experiences? I'm kind of in what? the, I'm in the, the whatchamacallit, what did everybody say? Wow or huh? Yeah, the I'm, I'm in the huh camp where the, the wow came later when it was like, huh, I can I can do stuff. I'm I'm doing things. And the my first day at work when I was on medication, I had so much paperwork from like two or three weeks. And that day I caught up on all of it. And then that's when I was like, wow, hmm. now what? That's cool. So that was that was interesting. And I was saying in the chat that, um, you know, what Brendan said really, really resonated because when we I started meds, it was like, our house is clean. What happened? This is cool. Roxy? Well, it just so happens that this was a conversation um, that Moira and I had with a couple of our ladies in our accountability team this morning. And I have had a hard time activating on some things. And it, it didn't really occur to me till they were talking about their meds and dosage that that might be a thing for me to address. Sometimes I just 
I just lose sight of, of that, um, the medication piece, you know, or I think another thing is that I, I want to err on the side of, um, extreme caution. I'm like, I'm 55. This stuff's going to give me a heart attack. So, you know, like I, I keep my dose really low, but we were talking about it. And when they were sharing sort of what works for them and different things that their doctors have said, I thought, oh, well, maybe that's it. Maybe I just need to up my dose a little bit. And so I, um, I don't, rec- I'm not recommending this, but my doctor has, let me kind of play a little within like a 10 milligram ratio radius, whatever. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to just try that. And honest to God, it was like what Brendan was saying. I was getting my, I was putting my makeup on this morning and I noticed I hadn't put the cap on my, my lotion. So I'm like, I screwed the cap on. And then I noticed I hadn't hung my towel and I hung my towel up. Like I, I had those little things where I was actually present enough and I was just happy for the reminder that I don't have to stay on the lowest dose and be miserable and continue to walk around like with, you know, underwater with combat boots. Like I have options, (laughs) you know, so I was appreciative. And today, today is a good day. Great. All right. Gina, was that helpful for you? So very helpful. Uh, I am looking forward to seeing these effects. Um, my doctor prescribed me fentermine, or I think it's for, like for like weight management, but it does actually up your norepinephrine. And I found myself like not being able to listen to podcasts and do New York Times crossword puzzles at one time. So I look forward to being able to focus. It, it helps me focus for sure, but I have I lack the motivation. So I'm guessing that's the dopamine aspect. So I look forward to, I guess trying out different meds yeah and it, you know the, the research shows that roughly you know 70 to upwards of 90 percent although i think the 90 percent number may be a little high um people have a positive treatment response to uh, adhd meds doesn't necessarily mean the first thing they try but it is a it is a very efficacious uh medication it just does require some some trial and error and uh you know trying to find a doctor that goes through the line how did people find their doctors for meds? Uh, it was what was available to me for my first one. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, that's, I wish I had a better answer than that. I mean, it's, I still don't have like work with an ADHD, like expert when it comes to my meds and, you know, so yeah, it, my guy's good enough. All right. Thank you. You bet. All right. I think we have time for maybe one more question here. All right. How about from Jacqueline? Uh, do you have any advice or resources for ADHD parents of ADHD toddlers, especially regarding discipline without all of us losing our minds? Brendan, you want to start this one? Uh, I'm going to start with, I don't like the word discipline. I say that every time I hear the word discipline, I do not like the word discipline because it implies, I don't know, vengeance to me, sort of. Like discipline to me is like that kid needs to know they're in trouble. And that's nonsense to me in my mind. I like things more along the lines of boundaries, especially when we're talking about toddlers, like just set really clear boundaries. And when the kid crosses that boundary, whatever it is, they, if like, if a kid touches a hot stove, right. Or goes near the hot stove, we're not going to like punish them for going near the hot stove. We're just going to go, don't go near the hot stove. And we're going to redirect them. We're going to bring them somewhere else. We're going to set a really clear boundary. Same thing for if they're running through the house screaming all the time and that doesn't work. We want to redirect them and rein them in as opposed to like yelling at them or something to make them stop screaming through the house. So more gentle boundaries than that word discipline. And I might be bringing my own subtext that doesn't apply to this question, but typically that's my response to that word. Um, Beyond that, in terms of like resources for what to do, I mean, my parent coaching groups are an eight week long resource that is from what I've been told phenomenal, which is what I want it to be. Uh, So that's a thing. And my podcast is a pretty solid resource as well, but you don't want to lose your mind. So you want to like have a relationship with your kid. You want to be on the same team, even when they're toddlers and don't really understand what a team is yet. But if you're working cooperatively with them, then as they grow up, you're going to stay on this cooperative plane so that when they're teenagers, there'll be less conflict. If they're teenagers, there's going to be conflict, but it'll be less and it'll be a more cooperative conflict as they age out. Um, so that that's where my brain went immediately. And I'm going to throw it to Moira. Thank you, Kinsir. It's uh, I just 
recently edited my next episode um, has Marisol, who has been on Eric's podcast many times. And we actually talked about our experiences having undiagnosed daughter, toddler children with ADHD and how people, what we wished was um, for, our, for our past selves was more education about ADHD, um, talking to people who had been there because there's so many things that we now recognize where their ADHD that we didn't understand in a toddler and that there were people who saw that. Um, and I think for me, particularly because I was undiagnosed and had two children, <clears throat> but I think for all parents who are parenting kids with ADHD is taking care of yourself. People will tell you that it's hard for everybody. This shit is way harder. It's way harder and it could destroy your relationship. It can drive you to addiction. And so whatever you need to do to be a good parent, when I had two kids, we brought in help and I went back to work early. I should have stayed at home with the help because that's what we needed. So that's what, you know, support for yourself and um, trying to find a, a community of people who, um, who get there, who get it, who's even been there for you. Because like, as Brendan said, right, it's going to take a long time with a toddler. Right. And, and the things that people say and do that they judge you, um, or tell you, you know, how they parent, it's just, it's not necessarily going to work. So not letting that affect your, your, um, how you parent your kids, you know, them better than anybody else. Well, yeah, I'm dealing with this at home right now because I have a six-year-old that is diagnosed. The best thing that I've always found to do is if I just start with the assumption that they're trying their best, that calms me down so much because it no longer is them willfully trying to just make life awful. It's them just trying their best and it's they don't know any better. Yeah. And it's like, okay, then I need to be the parent here. There's that adage of your kids... Uh, not giving you a hard time, they're having a hard time. And I think it's important to try to keep that in mind. Right? And then looking at the stuff like uh, uh, Ross Green's stuff, like what are the lagging skills that your kid needs? When you have ADHD, like it is a developmental delay. So like your kid's going to be behind in a lot of the social, emotional, executive functioning ability to self-regulate, right? So it's you know, instead of looking at them for their biological age, it's like a, you know, take a third. So your three-year-old's more like, Two, um, you know, your your ten year old's more like seven. If I'm doing the math correctly, there, take the oxygen mask as much as you need to. It is so so important, right? And especially if you also have ADHD and it's sort of like over, kind of bombarding your brain when you're dealing with with that stuff. Like, it's okay for mom or dad to take a time out themselves. Like I I have done it many 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 times because it, yeah, it can be it can be hard. Another component, and this was kind of alluded to, like, as parents, we all have this sort of, what are they going to think that we sort of live in fear of? And that's a thing that we need to put down. Because the more we carry that, the more likely our emotions are to spike, where the more anxious we are, which makes it harder to bring better skills to the table, the more likely, sort of especially for men, but not necessarily the more likely we are to try to present with a powerful front in public, like at the playground or something, which often looks like yelling and, and more aggressive type parenting styles, which are not so good. If you can lean into, no, I've got some skills. Like when I work at my parenting groups, a lot of the stuff that already came up comes up. We start with assume good intentions. We talk about Ross Green and all that stuff's there. But one of the things that's critical is my parent groups are about improving parental skill sets, right? There's a lot of stuff in between like just letting your kid do whatever they want and yelling at them until they give up and cooperate. There's a whole lot in between there, but a lot of my parents are coming to me at one end of that spectrum or the other and not seeing what's in the middle because we don't teach parents how to parent. And there, so I'm talking about like communication skills and connection skills and anxiety management. And one of the biggest pieces of that is no one is judging you unless you're yelling at your kids or your kids are running around like screaming maniacs. The two things that like we mo are more likely to let happen are the things we're actually being judged about. Whereas if your kid is like running around and screaming maniac and you step in and gently redirect them and calm them down, no one thinks you're a bad parent. 
But a lot of the time I see it on the playgrounds, even now when I'm out playing tennis with my kids, a kid is running around screaming and the parent comes in and is very loud or very stern and very like, do the da 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 da. And the kid is panicked. And that that doesn't have to happen. Like you can just go over and be like, buddy, what's going on? Like you're loud. <laughs> Let's rein it in, man. <laughs> like you can even with a toddler, you can communicate that they might not get the words, but they'll get the tone and that will bring them down. So just recognize when you're living in fear of outside views and try to put that into the box that it needs to be in. I think also interacting in a way that, you know, if you're in a tough situation, kind of ask yourself, was that predictable? Mm -hmm. The way that kind of played out. Yeah. And if you're rolling in, wonder like, would I treat a young adult this way? And if the answer is no, don't treat your kid that way. Mm. Roxy? Just to speak to the pressure of the um, imaginary judgmental expert that you sort of perceive observing all of your actions, I will say that um, that's what I did as a young mom, and it disconnected me from my intuition, and it also disconnected me from my creativity. So those were my two superpowers as Delaney's mom. And I, I look back on that and I think it was totally because I was trying to think of what's the right answer to appease this imaginary person. And, and it just an encouragement to get the help and the resources that you need so that you can have the freedom to explore some of those creative places and lean into that gut level thing that understands that your kid needs something different. Yeah, we gotta, we gotta start doing different instead of trying harder, you know? So let's do this. We are, we got to wrap this up. I think uh, finishing on a parenting uh, question lends us to our moment of dad. Will? All right. So there's these two guys at a bar and they're kind of like going at each other. And so then they find like, let's take this outside. And one guy leans down, makes a line in the ground, says, you cross this line and I'm going to sock you. What? Wow. That's that's the punchline. We've all missed it. It went over. Ouch. No. Oh, no. I got it. Wait. And it's that bad. You I, yeah. you almost don't want to get it. You almost are happy you're not getting that joke. <laughs> it is the most grown worthy joke I know. Oh, man. Can you say it again? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Two guys are in a bar and they go outside to have a fight. One guy. Leans down, makes a line in the ground, and says, "You cross this line, I'm going to sock you." I still don't get it. Can you explain it to us? <laughs> What's the line in the ground? What's the line in the ground? If he crosses it, it's the line that you cross. You get punched. That's it's the punch line. Oh God! Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> See, you're mad that you got it now, right? I'm sorry, everybody. Um, (laughs) That is painful. (laughs) Boo. I love that. Oh, my my gosh. I've had that in my head like all week. And I'm like, this is going to be so good because everyone's just going to be like, no. I want to thank everyone for uh, sticking with us here to the end, even with that. Um, If you you got some... uh, some support from this Q and a consider becoming a patron uh, over at ADHGrewired.com slash Patreon. We do this every second Tuesday of the month, same time, come to the website to uh, make sure you are getting notifications of when we do this each month. So thank you everyone for your questions. Thank you to all of our podcasters and we will see you back here next month. Bye everyone. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And 
Use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons can join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tivers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang. The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Make It Stick. The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown. The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.